Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Earth Dawn Survival Guide, a podcast for novices and masters alike. I am here with uh, my co-master, not my master, Earth Dawn Online developer, Josh. I am, of course, Dan, and on this podcast today, we will be discussing things magical and mundane at this moment, where I think we're going to start with things chronological. Possibly later, later on, we'll see if we can get to things theoretical and magical. So... <laughs> We spent all last episode talking about emails from everybody else. I think I think that horse no, is dead. No, no, yeah. I'm going to flog that till I'm crazy, which may have already happened. Who knows? But by all means, uh, if you'd like to hear us talk about anything you want us to talk about later on, uh, email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And right now, we're going to jump into the timeline and finally finish up and bring everything current to fourth edition. And this is mostly Josh's influence here, I'm assuming, with the rest of the writing team as well. Yeah, the first the first part of what we're going to cover is not my because <laughs> <laughs> um, we wrapped up. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's an awful way to put that. It's my fault. Um, Why not? I'll take it. I'll take the blame. I don't care. <laughs> um, we had wrapped up last time in our sort of coverage of the the history of things with the arrival of the triumph on the shore of Lake Van which was still, which is kind of the, the tail end of, of first edition and the, the supplement yes. War kind of details a lot of the info there. And we didn't really get into a lot of the immediate after effects of that, um, but we will go through those and then go through the, um, the events that, that are included in the time jump uh, of fourth edition and basically bring everything up to the, the present day as of the, uh, the, the absolutely because uh, First, second, and third edition, I believe, uh, stopped the timeline at 1507. That was the year that everybody was familiar with playing in, more, more than likely. Well, second did not. We right, sorry. We talked about that, I think, all the way back. But, yeah. Se- second edition did their own version of the Second Theron War and some development beyond that. Third edition, because it grew from the classic yes. edition, had rolled the timeline back or also started from that same right before the second Theron War situation, but never really advanced the mm-hmm. timeline at all. So, yeah, so there's that little bit of, of yeah, difference. So, so, yeah, we're, we're picking up basically at, at that point where second edition and third edition kind of had their diverging yeah, So timelines. we are retconning is the word I was looking for. <laughs> what second edition did. Yeah. And branching off from... So, yeah, we have uh, multiple universes. This is the infinite verse. I'm kidding. So... <laughs> Yes, in 1507, Viralis travels the pilgrimage route, flies off into a rage, and in 1509, General Currency and the Triumph traveled to the heart of Barsave and landed atop the Iodia Life Rock. Thank you for the pronunciation guide, because we answered that question a while ago, on the shores of Lake Ban, and... Basically, the, Th- the Therans return in force to indicate that they... Are reclaiming um, the territory. <laughs> ...are going to try again to reclaim yeah, their territory. Yeah, so... It's a dramatic show of force. And, and very yeah, and very soon after the Triumph lands, King Varilus III is found dead uh, in his rooms by his son. Yes. Dead in, I, I think you're right. I don't have Craven to War. There's an actual little like short fiction piece right at the beginning of The King is Dead that um, basically describes the discovery of his body. And I'm pretty sure it was Ned that did it. And all signs to begin with pointed to the Therans being responsible with the Triumph having just recently landed and then the King showing up dead, especially in a manner that was reminiscent of what had been done to Nedin during the attempted rebellion uh, many years earlier. All evidence basically pointed to the Therans as being responsible. They were not, but Nedin being a hot-headed, brash, young warrior... (laughs) basically mobilized the army and marched on on the Theron Behemoth, yeah. forces yeah, and met them at Prejor's Field in a battle that was a pretty devastating loss to the, the Throlic forces. Thera was not actually looking to fight at that point, uh, and so were not, like, didn't really want to, you know, crush the Throlic army, but also there were Theron agents who were aware that they didn't kill Varalus mm-hmm. and were more interested in, you know... Defending their position on that. Yeah, de- defending their position and revealing uh, that it was, in fact, 
agents of the Denarastus clan of Iopos from the northwestern corner of Barsave that were actually behind it in an attempt to get Thrall and Thera at each other's throats. This was something of a big revelation at mm -hmm. the time because there hadn't been a whole lot of information revealed about the city of Iopos um, and the people in it and just basically the, the revelation that, oh, these are bad guys. <laughs> And a, and, a, and a different kind of bad guy, in a sense, from from the Therans. Um, the Therans were pretty much a straightforward, like, you know, imperial domineering power. But the Denarastas apparently were kind of sneaky and underhanded and whatnot. The usual. And, yeah. <laughs> I think the actual quote from the general, uh, not in the book, of course, but I, I overheard him say on the battlefield, uh, we didn't kill your king, but if you want to fight, here's an ass whooping. So... <laughs> <laughs> Because they did. That battle took place over two whole days. And yeah, after they lost, Nedden started thrown down the path of military expansion because he really wanted to get them out of there. Yeah. You know, in, in kind of a, a continuing the, the family tradition of anti Theron activity mm -hmm. and basically having a moment to come to terms with things, recognize that just that in the same way that, that Thrall had defeated Thera the first time, and that was by basically forming alliances and, and bringing together diverse powers, uh, that that was going to be needed again. And so there was a stretch of Cold War, for lack of a better term, where Thrall was working to build its alliances in order to get ready for the inevitable battle that was, that was going to come, and at the same time trying to gather... Uh, information about this new threat from the north in the form of the dead yeah, because this kind of changed the political climate in Thrall, where half of them said, you know what? Theron's might is pretty darn big. We should just kind of make peace with them and figure out a negotiation strategy. And the other half said, oh, no, 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 bring it. We're going to go fight them off again. And yeah. Nedden, of course, was harboring that right after the death of his father. So he was channeling his grief, I believe, into action, which... In the initial, the yeah, do. I mean, as a warrior, <laughs> I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It was totally in character. Oh, absolutely. And and in the in the sort of background of all of this going on, the orcs started. Migrating. I was just going to get there. Yes, they they sent out letters, all titled the uh, the seeds of a nation, and they actually wanted to. They saw what was coming from Thera and Thrall. And they figured they might need to regroup their nation and not be so scattered across all of Barsave and actually create their own land again. Yeah, this this was largely the the result of Krathis Gron, who was the descendant of a legendary orc figure called Prakth yes. Gron, uh, who was the one that, according to legend, um, originally led the orcs out of slavery centuries and centuries mm -hmm. ago, and and originally founded the orc homeland of Carafod. Yeah. Krathis was apparently a descendant, um, grew up as a slave, and was inspired by the passions, and traveled to the east, and then returned, bearing these letters, the, the seeds of a nation, and basically became a sort of messiah figure. And in really sort of independent of the sort of Thrall and Thera conflict, but basically, you know, the orcs you know, have been a scattered people and now they need to be, to come back and reclaim the land that was their birthright. And and so men, not all of them, but, mm -hmm. but many of them uh, did The vast so. majority. Yeah. And um, in fact, in one of the sort of the, the there was a brewing conflict between uh, Throlic scouting forces and some Therans. And just as they were about to come into conflict, basically the ridges around the area where they were going to fight suddenly had you know, scores and scores of orc cavalry atop them. And Krathis basically said, hey, you're on our land, get out. <laughs> Such an orc thing to do. So they yes. did. Because I would not want to face that many angry orcs either, especially once they have a unified purpose of being anymore. So, yeah, they yeah. definitely fought off both the Therans and the, the, the Thrall army at that at Claw Ridge. So, I mean, ostensibly, Carafod and Thrall were, were allies, because Carafod definitely didn't want to have anything to do with mm -hmm. Thera because of the Theran support uh, slavery and the continuing practice of that. But Krathis had, had two main things to deal with. One was actually trying to forge a, a nation out of, you know, what to that point had been generations and generations of 
semi-nomadic yes. tribes without any kind of loyalty to anything but their own families. And not to insult orc fans, it's like herding cats. Um, or, orcs are awesome. Oh, um, I love orcs. My, you know, or, orcs are great, but you know, you've, you've got you know all of the difficulty that that would be you know involved in that. Plus, Carafad as a nation sort of ceased to exist in any kind of practical sense a couple of centuries before the mm-hmm. surge, and so there wasn't really anything there. So obviously, it was it was not <laughs> there. There, it's not like they were in any kind of rush to to go to war. We need to actually build something first. Yeah. And that's what a lot of, of their focus was on sort of over the, the subsequent years. And uh, Carafad is actually a, a, a pretty cool place, I think, to, to adventure. Very kind of Wild West in terms of the opportunities that are there. It's a very young nation, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of stuff like that. And a lot of like interesting potential political conflicts and, and whatnot that, uh, that can spring up there. So... Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool. But that, that basically, Carafad being a, a bulwark on the southwestern corner of Barsave, basically, if Thera, you know, the, the basically Thera would need to deal with them in some sense because they were on the, the doorstep of, of Vivane and Skypoint. Yeah. So all parties at this point, once that thing at Claw Ridge happened and Thera and Thrill kind of started amassing their forces, they spent the next three years. So we're looking at, what, 15... 11, 15, 12, I think. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, five, yeah. Fi- yeah, about three years. 1509, according to our official timeline in the book here, is when like all of the events of Prelude to War basically gotcha. happened, with the Triumph landing kind of early in the year, um, and then Carafad declaring sovereignty kind of kind of later on. So, yeah. yeah, so that that was kind of that. And then things kind of stabilized, and then in the first edition development, you have a, a couple of source books in the post Theron, uh, the post Prelude to War mm-hmm. era, that the books all kind of would have a, a, a year that they were sort of yes. set. You've got the Crystal Raiders and Carafad books. You've got the Secret Societies. The Theron Empire book, I think, actually is sort of set in that post Prelude era I as so. well. Although it doesn't have a whole lot of direct bearing so much on the situation in Bar Save, except perhaps uh, as, as a recognition that there was more than just sort of there, there was more going on. But yeah, so things kind of like stabilized in, in that point. And as it was leading up to just before the first edition line was closed, we were at like 1512, roughly speaking, in terms of the, the official campaign count. Yeah. So then we come across the Harwood incident. So three years later, everyone's got this cold little stalemate going on, but they're all, they all know that they're raising their hackles back further along. So everybody had kind of this Cold War mentality going on where they had all their weapons amassing and it was a stalemate where they would just stare at each other across the lines waiting for things to happen and then everybody doing their their own little like intelligence gathering and like their own little side projects and stuff like that totally and then once upon a time in this year 1512 theron patrol encountered a throlic merchant caravan on the plains north of the triumph and a running battle broke out between the caravan guard and the therons and moved from the open plains to the nearby town of harwood Unremarkable place otherwise, but it's named, and so therefore it's going to have some importance in this, and we'll get the names later. The exact cause of the conflict never determined, but the surviving members of the caravan were hauled back to the Triumph in chains. Therons claimed they were pursuing a fugitive, and the merchant house responsible for the caravan stated that the officer in charge of the Theron patrol pushed things a little too far, and the caravan was merely defending itself. So the survivors of the incidents told them, uh, everybody a group of adepts that got involved, causing events to spiral out of control as they did, and this just started to escalate all the so tensions. So this is, this is the <laughs> first... But so everything prior to this, everything that we have talked about up to this point is from yes. original development, from, from mm-hmm. first edition. The Harwood incident is the first new thing. And this is where I basically sort of sort of sort of kick started the 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 time jump. jumping forward. Yeah. Okay. One of the weaknesses, there are a few weaknesses, but one of the primary weaknesses that I felt was the situation... Okay, sorry. Let me take a step back. Understanding that we were going to do a time jump and that we were basically going to have the events of the Second Theron War having happened when we opened mm-hmm. on the, the fourth edition timeline. Yes. I think I've talked about this in the past on the show, but just to basically mention it again, starting out, 
I was really not confident in our in the ability to address the war as a supplement to the way that second edition did or the way that was sort of originally thought about for first edition. Fair. I thought that the broad strokes of the outline that was in place that had been released and shared by Lou, um, upon which Living Room Games based their version, mm-hmm. was good. There was like because because it was all based on stuff that had been there before. I didn't see any real reason to change that at all. And understanding that these that that certain events were going to happen and that the ultimate goal of that was to drive the Therans out of Barsave as a significant military power and to shift the focus to the Denarastus as kind of the, the potential big bad threat. Mm-hmm. I always, But looking to Living Room Games publication of, of the war, mm-hmm. one of the weaknesses, especially the, the early weaknesses in, in terms of what they had there, was that I did not feel that there was actually a, an, for lack of a better term, an inciting incident Fair. In the way that the landing of the Triumph kind of triggered off this series of events that happened to remake the face of the province, in a sense. Yes. Mm-hmm. That that the the Living Room Games version of the war and the outline all kind of were along the lines of, okay, well, Thrall has slowly, over the course of these past few development books, been building alliances, and there are storylines where they like have, have kind of formed made deals with some of the troll moods and Karafad. And blah 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 stuff, you know, stuff like that. And, and the Secret Society's book describes some of the activities that, like the Life Rock Rebellion and things mm-hmm. like that, that were taking part. So we had a kind of a, a shape of what was going on that was leading into this. And the outline and Living Room Games version all kind of started things off with. And Nedin basically releases this declaration, which is, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term, a declaration of independence, saying, you know, we are not going to. Like, we are not Theron servants, we are not Theron lackeys, we are independent, and we are going to fight them out. Yes. I, it always felt a little bit weird to me that he would just send that out. Like, I, I felt like just, oh, and he decides to send out this document, I don't know. Based I, on, yeah. They, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like, it's not like the... You know, it, it's not like our the Declaration of Independence from the American history was any kind. Like, but there were there were things that had happened that had started to rile things up and allow popular support for mm-hmm. separ- for for independence that allowed the people to come together to do that. N- to need to state that, yes. Yeah, like for example, the Boston Massacre, or you know, very various other things that had happened that that those of us here in the U.S. get a really brief. Uh, coverage of in high school. It was a very, very complex situation, but, you know, basically... There, All things but are. <laughs> I, I, I felt that it would make for an interesting situation if there was an inciting incident, something that happened that, that, that would allow, that would give Thrall cover to make this statement. Like, that they were kind of prepping for it, but waiting for the right moment... And this mm-hmm. thing was seized upon as the moment to do that. And in the write-up in the book, I intentionally left it vague in terms of what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And I also set it up as, you know, as you mentioned, kind of in the in the description, there was yes. a group of adepts that got involved. And no, like, <laughs> there's your group of player characters you know, yes. that, that was showing up and kind of getting involved in things. And the Therans are saying one thing, the Thrall is saying another. Nobody's really knows what the truth is on the understanding that the history chapters are told, are, are to pull out a $3 word here, they're diegetic. They are sort of presented mm-hmm. within the setting. Yes. Um, they are, they are, these, this is the tale as it is told by the historian sort of maybe a little bit after the fact. And so... The Therans are telling one story, the merchant caravan, the Throlic people are telling another. All that we really know is that something went down, the Therans, like, this caravan ran away, the Therans attacked a caravan, so This like, it happened at this town, the town got, there were adepts, like, nobody's really sure exactly the details of what happened. So the adepts made it worse, or... Or better. Or, or better. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm reminded now suddenly of, of the bit from Invader Zim where that's exactly like where I got it from. Worse or better? Better. Um, <laughs> the uh, but that had to be said. You, you made the fires worse. Um, <laughs> but that basically, like, I wanted to paint a situation that was we don't know, like, intentionally we don't know. Nobody's really sure what happened, but it is an it's a situation that allows Thrall allows Nedin to go. Okay, I can use this as if I spin it as Theron overreach, right? Whatever it was that actually happened, if I spin this as Theron overreach, right? It was an innocent political. merchant caravan. The Therans yes. attacked it. This will not stand. Mm-hmm. Whatever it was that that might have actually happened, the truth yes. behind the whatever, that is that that felt that was basically the inciting incident that I came up with for for. Nedin to then basically for justification for for Nedin to make his declaration in the in the face of what was the political situation in Thrall at the time. Yeah, because as we as was mentioned, there's kind of two factions within Thrall that there's mm-hmm. that there's the side that really kind of wanted to just like make their money and make peace with Thera, and the side yeah. that was a, a bit more radical and you know wanted to continue the traditions of independence that had kind of been established by by. Barrels. Yeah, they're used to 400 years of being free. Right. We kind of <laughs> talked about that. But with basically the Therans having attacked a merchant caravan, well, you know, hey, old guard houses that are really interested in just making money, they might do this to you too. Right? Like yeah. basically just kind of, again, an inciting incident, a situation that that allows Nedin to make his statement and say, okay, Here's our declaration. He had probably been sitting on, maybe been sitting on it a little while. He and Merrix and other like philosophers and whatnot in Thrall had probably been working on this and had the opportunity to release it. Yeah, um, get it right and, and release and it. That, that basically, it's okay. This is happening. I am calling on our allies. We are going to let the Therans know that this kind of behavior, that this will not stand. We're not going to put up with this, and so we're gonna we're gonna go and we're gonna drive them out of the the triumph. And once we do that, we are then going to. You know, march on Sky. You know, we're going to march on Sky Point and Vivane yeah. and kick them out of there. And it's mm-hmm. basically like they had landed on Iodia, and there was like, again, there was an incident there. Then we had this thing, and again, it was just like, let me tell a story that doesn't have the detail, but people can understand what's going on. And if people want to play through that time, or at some point in the future, if we go back, excuse me, and do a campaign book focused on the war here's like here are the rough details oh and now we have a book that maybe provides more specific information or no, it I, provides vague enough so that you can like work this into your own game so like this is the inciting incident that, that kicks off that that time that time jump no i think that is a perfect way to do it because i listened to a different podcast recently that had an interview with lou prosperi the Mm-hmm. Jack Kirby of Earth Dawn, laying all the groundwork for the rest of us here, where the edict was give them just enough information so that they can run with it, but don't give them too much to bog them down. And yeah. I'm paraphrasing horribly on that one. So I think you did a fantastic job with the Harwood incident because this does make uh, Thera then made the first move and sent a right. cohort- Well, basically, basically, yeah. I mean, so so this incident happens, the, the first move was Nedin releasing the declaration, right? Yes. Basically saying, okay, we're not going to stand for this. I'm calling all on our allies to help us drive the Therans out. And the Theron yeah. response to that is, oh, wait, what? And basically sending, like, in, in much the same way that, that back in the first war, they weren't really, maybe weren't quite ready or weren't sure what was going on. Yeah. Like, sent, basically sent some, sent some troops up to, like, in the aftermath of this, sent some troops up to barter town yeah, to, to barter town and, and to the gates of Thrall and exactly. to say like, Hey guys, you know, like basically remember the last time that you said like, you know, remember like three years ago when you like came out to march against us and we kind of stomped you. <laughs> do you really want to do that again? I mean, there's yeah. no need for Like if you guys would just behave, we'll, Remember that fight you didn't want to have between two and Ash Whippin you actually got? You want to do that again? You want to do that again? <laughs> you know, and, and so, like, basically, the, the, the Therans appealed to, basically, appealing to, trying to, rather than appealing to Nedin, 
were appealing mm-hmm. to the Throlic citizenry and said, hey, if you turn them over, turn them over to us, everything will be fine. Like we, we won't attack you. We'll let you go we'll, back to doing your thing. We'll take your king away and you'll be good. Yeah. Like you can, you know, whatever. And if you, you know, don't, it's an act of war. Yeah. And, it, you know, basically, <laughs> basically turn him over as a, as a gesture that you are going to submit to our authority. And if not, then we understand, you know, then understand what that means and face the consequences. Yes. You know, I, again, like, as, I, as is in the text there, like, nobody's, like, again, the, the reasons why this is happening is not completely clear. You know, uh, like, the explanation that's there is kind of the best one, is the one that makes the most sense, is that mm-hmm. the Therans are like, you know, we, we won before, maybe we can appeal to their better, the- their better nature, or, or maybe, you know, appeal to them maybe instill a little bit of fear in them and, you know, they'll, they'll submit and you'll, we'll have a, a, a coup or something along those lines that'll result in, in troll. Yeah. They're, they're trying for checkmate first yeah. move instead of last move. Right. Yeah. Basically, 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 trying, try, basically trying to go for it for an early resolution is, and that basically by, by cutting the head off the serpent in a sense, by removing Ned, yes. you know, in, in power in troll that they would, end up with somebody on the throne that is more favorable to them so that they could go back to doing what they want to do, which is basically rule things and not have mm-hmm. to, you know, expend resources to do it. Exactly. They, they like a minimum of effort, <laughs> you know, and, and basically the, the throw response was no. With 500 um, troops behind yeah, them. Basically like basically sent their own troops out and said, no, we're not going to do that. And then again, much like the Harwood incident, nobody's quite <laughs> sure exactly what happened. But then, like part of Barter Town burned down, like yeah, a quarter know, of it, twenty five percent. Like the like the parlay between the the Theron general and the the envoy from Thrall there at the gates was tense, but no fighting broke out. And the Therans mm-hmm. were like, "Well, okay, then fine." And they kind of like withdrew a little bit. And then that night. Stuff burned down. Stuff, stuff like <laughs> stuff burned down, and and again, it's like, well, there were a number of possibilities as to how that could have happened. Was it the was it the Therans causing problems? Was it, you know, was it like an attack, perhaps a, an attack maybe by Thrall against the Theran forces that got out of hand? Was it mm-hmm. something? As actually, I think later in the book, I reveal that my official version of what happened is that it was something else. Like it was completely unnected to the the struggle between Thera and Thrall. Thrall, and Thrall. Um, yeah. yeah, it's on page fifty five of the GM guide. The Great Fire. Yes. Right. Shortly before the Second Theran War, a large fire tore through Barter Town, destroying almost a quarter of the city and taking hundreds of lives. There are many rumors about the cause of the fire, but given its timing in relation to the hostilities between Thrall and Thera, most believe it was the result of Theran agents trying to destabilize the situation outside the kingdom and give Thrall a more pressing problem to deal with. Truth of the matter is that <laughs> somebody saw the tense situation there as an opportunity to move against Clystone to try and mm-hmm. kill him because yes. there had been new attempts on Clystone's life before. Um, yeah. Basically, somebody tried to kill Clystone and it got out of hand and burned down a quarter of the city. Yes. But it was actually com- like completely unconnected, really, other than it was a, an act of opportunity. And so consequently, like, again... It wasn't Thrall, it wasn't Thera, necessarily, but nope. each side would blame the other for what might have happened, and, like, again, things... Oh, somebody had huge cojones trying to take him out with two standing armies next door. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, well, uh, but again, it's like, there's an awfully convenient cover Yes. if this goes, you know, again, like... Everything's political, the, people. The Well, everything's political, but the, the idea of... Sometimes stuff just happens like people make sometimes make rash decisions or decisions yes. that might seem good in the moment and things spiral out of control and yeah. little things can make a, a, a big difference. Um, and so consequently, you've got like, OK, there's this incident. Thrall makes a declaration. Sarah kind of makes overtures is like, look, we don't really want to go to war with you guys, but if you're going to force our hand, fine okay, well, you're on notice, and then something else immediately happens that is, Mm -hmm. the timing is convenient enough that it just basically inflames tensions even further, and now basically at this point, it's, you know, Thrall's response is, oh, hey, we told them to to stuff it, and they tried to burn down the city in their wake. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and so now there's even (laughs) more... It's on now. (laughs) Yeah, and now there's even more justification 
again, just like using what is available to like drive the political direction and the discourse of, of what's going on. And so basically with this second lesser, completely unconnected, but still notable incident. And I, I wanted to shake things up and, and, and that's just like, well, let's shake things up in barter town a little bit. Yeah. Cause it you hadn't know? been shook up before. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's like we discussed in our episode on barter town a couple, you know, a couple of episodes ago. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a sort of glorified tent city with tight quarters and not great construction and fire. Like, Historically, it's, it's like happen. a really, it's a really <laughs> bad thing, and a fire breaks out in a place like that. And even with elementalist magic and stuff, it's possible that it can do a lot of damage and cost a lot of lives before Real it's quick. brought under control. And that's yeah. basically what happened. And it, uh, and it allowed me to, like, I wanted Clystone to live because Clystone is a is a great character, but I wanted it to kind of change the situation enough where he would perhaps be a little bit more paranoid would shake things up again just a little bit like it doesn't radically change the face of things but it is a little bit of a, of a change and just kind of like the the escalation of events leading up to things kick off and it just kind of starts rolling on its own momentum oh yeah that's i mean that's how stuff happens in, it's in, entirely in how some ways it, the gulf of the gulf of tonkin for vietnam comes to, immediately to mind because i read about that recently and just yeah that spiraled out of control like mm -hmm. crazy so it's just one little incident causes another yeah. one and, and, causes and another if one, you know and, and and if you've got a situation where one or both sides are really interested in pushing towards a particular objective they are mm -hmm. going to capitalize on that and while gonna find a way to get there yeah and and while you know Nedin's ultimate goal was to drive the therans out the Theron, the Therans had kind of conflicting things is that the general in command of the forces in Barsave wasn't mm -hmm. particularly interested in having a war because wars are costly and like waste resources Long. and he doesn't really want to. But he has pressure from his boss back on Thera, back on the island of Thera, saying, hey, yeah. have you sorted this thing out with those peasants in Barsave yet? <laughs> He's kind of, you know. I'm working um, on it. <laughs> they are, they are commanders. They are leaders of large forces, but they're people too. And they've got their own like goals and agendas and stuff like that. And so, you know, just basically it's like, okay, we're going to have the war. Let's have some stuff happen that just basically makes that inevitable. It, it, yes. Like that there are, and, and again, like these are things that looking at it sort of in hindsight, these are events and things that are going on that player characters could become involved with or could have been involved with in terms of, of what's going on. Yeah. One of the, one of the, the troubling things with living room games bar save at war, but even just the concept of the, the war supplement is that it's a very, very large scale kind of operation mm -hmm. and that can make it difficult for player characters to get involved and feel like they can, influence things yeah affect some of the outcomes or events yeah and and i mean it, it can be done but they, there's you you really want to be careful not to turn the events of something like that into a theme park ride where basically the player characters are just kind of going along witnessing the things that are happening mm -hmm. which is which is part of the reason why i was a little bit reluctant to address it as an early supplement uh with the war is just how do you handle that? We've got a lot more experience now handling adventure design in terms of like allowing the protagonists to con continue protagging. So, <laughs> well put. So then, so then we have the war. Well, then we have the war, but the the campaign of harassment was launched against the Triumph, and even Queen Alachia sent a contingent along with Thrall to help mm -hmm. capture and take over. The yes. triumph. Yeah. So that was kind the, of noteworthy. Yep. Yeah, this this is so this is one of those situations where the reason is not given in the history as presented here, because the reason much like for example, we talked about um Ardelia a couple of you know yes. in response to a question a, a couple of episodes ago. And you may people may notice going through the, the fourth edition history chapter, we don't talk about Ardelia at all because while she is important 
in the sense that like char player characters who might have gotten involved with their story, whether through Infected or some of the other related events, her story does not really is not really important in the bigger picture of the conflict between the, the nations. Um, it's yes. a great story. It's a personal story. It's it's a it's a valuable story, but it is not one that the it's not one that the historians are going to are going to be concerned with, mm -hmm. right? Like the the player characters who were involved with her care. The great dragons care. Um, Hefera, while he was still alive, cared. <laughs> um, but like her story, she is just in a, in a sense she is just one person who's kind of caught up in the wake of events that are larger than herself. Um, and so she doesn't appear in the, the fourth. Her story still happened, but it's not something that the historians would have recorded. It wouldn't have, mm -hmm. have mattered in the sense of, oh, we're telling the tale of the of the conflict between between Thrall and Thera. Oh, and by the way, here's this entire like sidebar about, well, one of the Therans that was there did this little side thing where he was interested in this girl and whatever. Yeah. Why is this important? We don't know, but we're going to mention it. Yeah. It didn't just, it didn't seem like it was something that fit within the scale of the history chapter. In okay. much the same way, the, the, because of how insular and secretive the, the blood wood is, the reason why Alakia decided to support the troops to, to support the attack on the triumph with her own troops is not revealed because the, yeah, basically the assumption would be, oh, well, you know, obviously overtures had been made to, her by Nedin um, for support yeah. in terms of because obviously the the antipathy between the Bloodwood and Thera is well known. Maybe yeah. she will help us drive them out. And so I, there are some assumptions I think that the historian might make. It's just like, oh yes, and they sent some. They sent a small token of troops as well. And mm -hmm. like the reason why isn't addressed because it's not important Drains. in the in the grand scheme of things. In the original outline, it was that the dragons did something that sort of manipulated events to, you know, basically get the, the bloodwood involved and the extent to which what exactly they did, you know, left it open. Yeah. Just that happens because dragons work in mysterious ways. But, but I mean, the fact that the, you know, that like the dragon's involvement isn't even really brought up at all. It's just, Oh yeah. You know, obviously she would have sent troops because bloodwood and Thera didn't get along and, you know, they probably asked for some help and boom, going from there. So, yeah, this actually, uh, the capture of the triumph is where you have a whole bunch of forces finally acting as one. And instead of acting rashly, King Nedden finally had a plan of attack that they worked on a little bit. So you had yeah. the Scrang warships bombarding from the, from the rivers and you had air forces acting as escorts to the ground troops. And so you had probably some troll sky raiders in there as well. And you had elven forces and dwarf forces yeah. but and then, orc forces all happening at the same time. But then again, you notice in there, again, the appearance of, you know, this ruse was intended to sneak several elite adept groups inside the protective dome. Like, again, yes. here's here's our little bit where our player characters might have been involved. Because, again, as... trying, to, trying to follow the original timeline, the original outline and the Living Room Games version as mm -hmm. much as possible. Because I knew yes. that there would be people that had been played through that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, kind of going, yeah, so so that that kind of stuff. Yeah, so all to sneak people in to capture it from the inside. So, yeah, work in your uh, gaming group right there, folks. That's how you do that one. That's how you do that. So the, the Triumph was granted back to Omasu, and uh, he started using this as a way station for the Overland Trading Company, which is also right. in the very far north, uh, between the Bloodwood and Parn Lane. Uh, no, you're thinking you're thinking of the Midland Trading Post. I am thinking the Midland Trading Post. Good yep. gravy! No, the, I'm sorry, the, I've spent the, a the lot Overland, of time there. The Overland Trading <laughs> Company is Omasu's is Omasu's merchant company, and they are all over the place, based yes. extensively out of Trevar. You know, it, it was kind of like, well, okay, you know, if we if the the Triumph gets captured, who do we give it to? Omasu would be is the most likely. Because it's his life rock. He's from Iowa. I was going to say, he's an obsidian first off. So, yeah. yeah. And so, it, you know, that, that kind of like liberating it and, and sort of granting it to him as they continue to research or try and figure out what they can do to perhaps free the or, or heal the, the life rock and the damage done to it by the, the fortress. Yeah. And then uh, since that started off the wave of roll 
fighting back effectively. We now come to Vivane. Yes. And this is a whole fun story that I'm pretty sure you had a little bit of fun in writing, but uh, yeah, a, a lot <laughs> of this, a lot of this is kind of taken from the original outline. So there are a lot of similarities between this and, and the second edition version. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of differences that are, that are notable. But again, I but, think you have to open so that player characters who've gone through this could insert themselves in these little tiny sections, which perhaps right. was not done in the yeah, original yeah, Living yeah. Room Games version. So, you know, uh, I again, because the, the, the original idea was, was a, was a good one. The, the foundation and the outline that was there was, you know, was a solid one to um, have uh, taken place um, in terms of, of the, the tactical plan of Thrall and, and her allies was, was a good one in terms of, of how they were going to, going to do things. And I didn't see any reason to dramatically alter that in any way. Um, yeah, that, that, that the changes really came out in the details as opposed to the broad strokes. Yeah. So a good idea is still a good idea. So yeah, why would you not use it? So at this point, 2000 cavalry from Carafad joined up outside Vivane and uh, Sky Point. Uh, Jairus sent a small force as well. A couple of airships. The great dragon uh, Vastanjas joined the fleet accompanied by three smaller dragons. So this is the first time we have dragons getting involved yeah. uh, uh, the, overtly in public <laughs> instead of just behind the scenes pulling yeah. some strings. They've been, they have been behind the scenes quite a bit um, and they are behind the scenes here as well. Vast and Jass being of the great dragons active in Barsave at the time, being the one that was most friendly and open to the younger races, as, as the dragons put it, basically ended up kind of going and, and getting involved there. But then of course... Basically, the Barsavian Alliance, accompanied by Vast and Jazz, are attacking Sky Point, which is the, the Theron base of operations that their, that their air fleet is based out of, over governor and, and commanders and all that sort of stuff is, is based out of the, the massive fortress. Um, but there's also the city of Vivane, which is not terribly far away, but the, the Alliance could not necessarily handle both. Mm-hmm. But basically, as it's related in the history the horror cloud Stormhead, which, as long as anybody knew, had just basically been sitting on top of that hill uh, a little ways away, suddenly started moving. The history, the secret behind this, for the people who have read the original timeline or read the second edition version or whatever, is basically the great dragons did powerful ritual magic to basically bring it there. Um, that the dragons were going to deal with the vein to prevent it from reinforcing Sky Point so that mm-hmm. the Alliance could deal with it. This is... One thing that was changed from the original outline by Living Room Games, and I changed back, because if you go back and you read my original review of Far Saved <laughs> War, which I wrote 17 years ago or so, <laughs> that this was like one of the bigger problems that I had. Living Room mm-hmm. Games changed it so that what the dragons did was cast a ritual that was going to put like a citadel-like dome of elemental air over the city to prevent mm-hmm. people from going in and out. And that it yeah. was this ritual that drew the attention of Stormhead and brought it to the city. Whereas in the original outline and in the fourth edition version of events, the dragons intentionally cast a ritual to move Stormhead onto the city. <laughs> Which is just one step removed, so it makes more sense. Yeah. Well, it, it's basically that, that ultimately the dragons, they're dragons. Like, they mm-hmm. don't really care. They're not nice. They're not I mean, they're, no, they're ostens- ostensibly, ostensibly on the side of the Barsavian Alliance, but that's mainly because they have no love for Thera and want to yeah. stick it to them if they can. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have their own pawns and powers and whatnot involved and really don't want the Therans mucking about with them. We will talk about why in a later episode. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> but, that, but that's basically it. And the, but the dragons aren't nice. The dragons don't really have... Even the n- nicer ones, like Mountain Shadow and Icewing, mm-hmm. don't really care about the lives of individual name givers. No, and and much like when They're blinking the eye know, to them, you know, much like back in the the days before the Scourge, when Thera was sort of first looking at you know at sharing things and made the move against the dragons, and then Icewing showed up and the dragons killed a whole bunch of powerful people. Uh, the mm-hmm. dragons are basically taking this moment to remind the Therans of why you do not mess with dragons. Yes. Basically. 
and and this is something that again the, the like the lower the lesser people get caught in the crossfire when you are dealing with like the struggles and conflicts between incredibly powerful beings regular people just get smushed like it's the collateral damage that happens when there is a war and it's not cool it's not it's it's, no. it's kind of a it's a it's a crappy situation and but the dragons live for centuries the dragons like some of the great dragons for were around eons. from the previous at age of magic a city isn't that big a deal like the the couple thousand lives or whatever that might be lost as a result of this eh, it's nothing it's they're, grass they're, under the feet of two bull elephants fighting yeah <laughs> that's exactly how insignificant that is to them you know I, I i really think that especially if you look at some of the other stuff that was going on in events like with ardelia basically being caught up as a pawn in the game mm-hmm. you know in the with the dragons and yeah like the things that are going on i i think that there is a really strong theme there of the dragons anybody powerful has their own agenda and is trying to to push like their their own goals and objectives and if they they might be decent to you or like if you are not in the way then then that's fine but sometimes you're in the way and you well little you're in the way it's smushed um yeah and so you know just like dragons aren't nice dragons shouldn't be nice like as cool and personable and whatnot as mountain shadow and ice wing and stuff are kind of portrayed particularly when you look at, at mountain shadow and dunkles on in shadow run as like yes. this kind of like benevolent like good guy you also have low you know you've also <laughs> got Usun, um who really doesn't give two bits about any you know doesn't give two bits about any person you know that's not yeah. a dragon and and so like the dragons are going to do what they're going to do. And, you know, a few thousand people are going to be squished. Eh, you know, it's kind of a shame, but their lives were just an eye blink to us. So it's not thematically. And I just want to remind people that, you know, dragons ain't your friends for the no. most part. Like they're, you know, no. they, they, I, they I, are, I... they are powerful. They are inscrutable. They will do what they want. And there's not much about it that you can do. I, I, I will quote my favorite Marvel villain from my favorite Marvel movie. Uh, an ant has no quarrel with a boot. <laughs> you know, so 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 there was that. Basically, the 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 bringing of Stormhead was in the original outline, but making it be a deliberate act by the dragons is a lot more powerful and thematically resonant, I think, than also just the fact that like the great dragons who have lived for thousands of years and know more about magic than anybody else miscalculate and don't realize that this thing that they're doing is going to draw the horror cloud. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Dragons, like, col- like the, all the dragons working together, and there was a lot of stuff, like, in the Dragon Sourcebook and some other stuff that, that um, like, that Vaz and Jass had talked about. It's like, yeah, ritual magic is powerful stuff, and even we are reluctant to mess with it. Trifle, the fact that yeah. they broke out the ritual magic to do this thing with Stormhead is a big deal. And the fact that they would do that, for lack of a better term, casually... And as a result, miscalculate and bring the cloud onto the city. Just, it never sat right with me. No, fair. I, I can't imagine the dragons would be rash and they would calculate this out ahead of time because it is ritual magic. They would double, and they, like I said, they know how to do this. Yeah. And it would make more sense for them. Oh, really? You want to mess with this? We're going to sick the horrors on you. You know why? Because we can sick the horrors on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dragony thing to do. Yeah. So they're dragons. Dragons are awesome. Dragons yeah. are terrible. Dragons and I'll take an Earth Dawn dragon over a D&D dragon any day of the you know, week. So I, I cannot now remember the exact quote, but basically in, in the Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett, there's the one, uh, I think it's in Lords and Ladies, which is the one that has the, the elves crossing over, and it's talking basically them as, as the, like, the old school style fairies, that mm-hmm. they are wonderful and you know, awesome, and like all these words, and it's like, the last thing they are, however, is nice. <laughs> like, like basically using the original definitions of some of the some of the words that have gotten like a positive connotation, but that like just stuff like I can't remember the, the exact phrasing right now. But anyway, okay. but dragons should be like that awe inspiring, and when you recognize what is going on and what they are capable of, you really should be nervous about going up against them. So yeah. That being said, 
Destruction followed in the cloud's wake once it actually got to the city. So Storm had caused significant damage to Vivane, and the bulk of the fighting took place in the skies. So Throlic airships, captured Theron vessels, everything just absolutely bombarded the, the tower's defenses, and dragons and crystal raider vessels intercepted and disabled Theron airships, and it was just a big old brawl, essentially. I mean, it was your classic throw everything you can on the screen. Yeah. From Star Wars, it's just, there's a thousand things going on at yeah, once. Yeah, it's your, it's your battle at Minas Tirith. It's, you know. Yes. Uh, so, what happened where we can actually kind of almost work in anybody's player character party, King Nedden directed it and led the fighting from aboard uh, his galleon when danger presented itself by the Theron weapon. Yeah, the Therans basically had this powerful, magical laser beam, for lack of a better term. Um, Fair. They could, you know, but it's sort of like the, the, the Death Star weapon. Beam, Like, yeah. if, if you're thinking of the, if you're, like, the, in the battle in Return <laughs> of the Jedi, right, in, in the, yes. the, the climactic battle in Return of the Jedi, the space fleet over the, the forest moon of Endor, where the, the Death Star's weapon is live, and it's using it to fire occasionally to blow up the capital ships. Like, that's the sort of thing that, that's going on here. It's like, this yeah. weapon doesn't fire very often, but when it does, it's devastating. Massive. And yes. so consequently, recognizing that that needs to be taken out, net in aboard the Millennium Falcon, I mean... <laughs> King's Justice. <laughs> um, decides to fly into the superstructure. No. Exactly. So a, he brings along with him a strike force of elite adepts. Hint, oh. hint, wink, wink, hint, nudge, hint. nudge. Yeah. Yes. And got through all that and a massive wave of magical energy from said you know, Again, you know, where, where the defenses will not allow a larger vessel, a smaller exactly. one might slip through. Exactly. And, and ending the discussion about power versus agility. So <laughs> <laughs> agility wins. So the horror cloud over Vivane, easily visible from the skies, broke into several smaller pieces and began drifting away at this. And... Somehow, the Theron weapon exploded. Yeah. We're not entirely sure how. Sending out several blasts of magical energy at once, several airships, both Theron and Alliance, so, uh, damaged by the blasts. Yeah, this is, this is again, this is sort of something that is from the original outline. Um, yes. this, is connect, this is connects to the Locus under the vein, mm -hmm. and that the Theron magicians were more or less tapping into that magical energy to power the weapon. And as a result of whatever happened, as they were, as the weapon was disabled, basically caused the feedback that basically sent a magical spike, temporarily lowering the magic level of the, like something, like basically something super powerful and bizarre happened magically as a result oh, of Oh, they reversed feedback. the polarity. Yeah, they basically, they reversed <laughs> the polarity of the, of the main, of the main um, navigation array. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, basically like, they needed to, to disable the weapon. It's a powerful weapon that is connected magically with stuff. And, yes. you know, there's basically a big magical backlash that happens. Yeah. And, and part uh, of this explosion actually sent a shockwave or an after effect or shrapnel, take your pick, to actually strike the great dragon Vastinjas himself. Yeah. And uh, we're not sure if he's dead or oh, not. Oh, he's dead. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. It's It's... It's fairly clear that that he is. You know, what's not clear is whether the explosion killed him or mm -hmm. whether he exactly if, his exact if he cause of death in air is not known. And then gravity killed him when he hit the ground. Yeah, <laughs> you know whether the or impact. whether he was just you know whether he was killed by the blast or whether he was just knocked out and then died when he fell and something landed on him or you know like whatever. But basically, yeah. like big explosion, lots of chaos. Things basically, happen more. Basically, with the with the loss of the weapon. The, the Therans realize that they have lost, basically. Mm -hmm. The overgovernor uh, basically turns tail. You know, basically, the, the cloud is, has, has hit the vein, like, big explosion on the deck of Sky Point. Uh, lots of yeah. damage to both Theron resources and whatever. Like, basically, you know, that this is the, like, okay, psh, the, the Therans kind of retreat, um, leaving some people behind. But basically, mm -hmm. like the the higher ups, the, the the governor and you know generals and stuff, kind of retreat, and um, and, and so uh, again, like we're we're in the like this is in the space of like 
big, big explosion. And then the next several paragraphs are things that happen over the course of the next probably 10 to 15 over the course seconds. of the next, you know, well, not seconds, but like okay. happen in relatively short span of time. And because yeah. of the chaos of what's going on in the wake of the explosion, mm-hmm. what is the, like, again, historians are, have a hard time piecing together the specific exactly what happened we, we, or well, yeah. why things happened. These all took place in the midst of a war. We know that these things happened, but we're not exactly sure why, because many of the people that would know are now dead. Yes. So, yeah, explosion, Vaz and Jass is killed. In, the, in that span. This is like a John Woo film. All of a sudden, everything slows down after the explosion, and you get little snippets in slow motion of everything that's happening over the next... The yeah. flagship of the fleet, the King's Justice, doing... Plows little, itself. Basically <laughs> crashes into the support pil- one of the support pillars of Sky Point mm-hmm. that basically sends the damages Entire. the the structure. And yeah. it is like, you know, very rapidly, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to wreck it. And basically everybody kind of pours the firepower on and basically collapses sky point down onto the ground below terra uh, firma, 800 feet. That's basically it. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's, that's the end of the battle. The, the King's justice, the flagship is lost, buried in the, the rubble of the, you know, in the rubble. Um, Nedin is lost, presumed dead body, never recovered, but, like the battle is over, the Therans have retreated, the the Barsavians have won the day, but at a fairly hefty cost. You know, the yes. cost of however many lives were killed by the horror cloud in the vein, the loss of the troops in the regular battle, the loss of Nedin, you know. And, the and, loss of a city structure that fell eight hundred feet and killed you know, probably ten thousand people or more. <laughs> well, you know, killed you know, killed killed lots and lots of people. Yeah. But like it's basically and then, you know, the dragons show up and do their ritual stuff over Baz and Jass's corpse, you know, in terms of yeah, protecting. a week later, yeah, King King Nedin's never found, and Vos- yeah. and Mountain Shadow shows up, burns Vas and Jass's corpse with fire, so that can't be reclaimed or used in any ritual magic yeah. or um, pattern and, discovery and, or anything like that. Yeah, and then and then we get into basically cleanup, the aftermath. Always, yeah. This is just there's a lot of unrest in Thrall. And yeah. Iopos took advantage of this to explain their influence as well, which is, of course, probably yeah. going to come up in the Iopos book. Uh, well, that, that, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that, that, like, Iopos takes control of Jairus. And again, some of the stuff that is talked about in this tail end of the, of the history section gets addressed mm-hmm. in the setting chapter that follows up as to, as to what's going on. But yeah, Thrall is, Thrall, I mean, there was no heir. We had talked about, you know, what had going on with the, with the Thrall Curse. and Kings and, and Nedden's line. Uh, he yep. had no heir, and so there was mm-hmm. no clear succession to the throne. Nope. There's, like, the aftermath of just basically kind of cleaning up after a war and the loss of, of troops and stuff that are involved there. Thera has retreated. It is a fantastic opportunity for Iopos to, you know, make a play to expand oh, totally. their own their own control and to establish them as, oh, yeah, these are, like, you're going to need to deal with them eventually. Mm-hmm. But Thrall is all, you know, focused on, okay, we need to determine the line of succession and Kovar, who is the current King was basically completely made up on my part because I didn't think that there was anybody that had been presented in any of the, even the later source books of first edition as a individual in full that would actually take the throne. There are mm-hmm. people that would be involved in that choice. Like Selenda, for example, who was the, you know, sort of head of the, most senior rival house to House of Alice, which was the royal family. Uh, like, she would be involved, but she would not become king. And I just kind of felt that I didn't want to go into, like, oh, and now Thrall is going to have a civil war, like, in the wake of that. Like, that yeah. seems to be a bit too much, and that in the wake of that, there would be enough people interested in kind of keeping, like, we need to mourn the king, we need to mourn our dead from the war, we mm-hmm. won, let's... I think enough level heads would have prevailed to put forward a an unremarkable compromise candidate that would basically in the wake of, oh, well, our previous two kings, Varolus the Third and Nedin, both basically like antagonized Thera yeah. and whatnot. And, you know, we kind of just want to quiet down and like we won, but it's 
you know, not maybe a pirate victory, but it's kind of rough. And so, yeah, I just like made up of uh, someone who basically got chosen as the new king. Well, and you probably saved about 16 pages of writing space by well, not actually saying, now, now we're going to go from a monarchy to a, a, a democracy and then all that. Yeah, like that, 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 that I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't see that happening. I, I no, would, me you know, think that, um, that, again, there would be enough situation. I, I wanted Thrall to be a little bit less of a power player in the province. Mm -hmm. just because it would leave more opportunity for player characters to actually get involved in active troubleshooters rather than necessarily need to, oh, well, we can just run the Thrall and they'll come and solve our problems for us. Mm -hmm. But also just in the wake of an event like the Second Theron War and the tragedy of losing Nedid, who nobody was found, people can do with that what they want. Exactly. There is absolutely a living legend cult that is sprung up around the ruins of Sky Point that are convinced that, that Nedin actually has faked his death mm-hmm. and has decided that, you know, he was never really wanted to be king anyway. And so has basically gone off to just be a warrior adventurer again. Well, yeah, he, he probably, from, uh, from their point of view, rose from the ashes and looked around and says, oh, we defeated him. Great. My job is done. I can go disappear now. <laughs> yeah, whether <laughs> whether that, you know, we, we have not decided whether that is actually the case or not, whether he is actually alive or dead, but that's why, you know, nobody was found. People can do with that as they wish in their games, and I think it, it provides a good opportunity for for like cults and, and beliefs and stuff like that to come well, up. Not only down there, but also in Thrall, that there will be people who don't see like if Nedin is actually alive, then like the current king is is illegitimate in some way. Like there's a lot mm-hmm. of potential that can be explored later on. But I also totally. wanted to in like setting the the status quo for the fourth edition era, like deal with the war. Let's, let's do some things that establish a new status quo that is really good for getting into the game and adventuring and stuff like that mm-hmm. and leave some room to explore for future setting development later on. It's Yeah, it's like it's like being in Star Trek and you've got the Romulans and the Klingons. You've got two enemies on, on two different fronts. And so now you've got the Denarastis clan and Iopos and you've got uh, the Therans on the other end of the world as well. So either one can make a power play at the same time. You know, if you're in bar save and you're uh, a throw light... Is that right? Is that the right yeah. word? If you're, awesome. Yeah. If you're a throw light, then you got to make sure you're watching out for those and the horrors because they're, they're always looking in the background as well. So you've got plenty yeah. of movers and shakers going on. And as we said before in the last podcast, this one, everything is political. So you've got oodles of storylines you can go with. You can send yeah. your players out on uh, an espionage run to Iopos. Uh, you can have them intercept all kinds of other things, other assassination attempts on the new king that you've got there as well. And so you've got just a whole bunch of more things you can actually do now that there's a little bit of unrest in Thrall. And as you well, said, their power is reduced. Yeah. I mean, there's, there is like, we had a period and this is one of the problems with meta plot games mm-hmm. and settings that grow over time is that like you will tend to have, as you have events that happen to advance to like for player characters to get involved with and advance the story that you will like have a long period of time of like not a whole lot happening, like historical background setting writing wise. And then you suddenly have this span. Like if you look at it, it's like, Oh, like 1506 or whatever, like things are like, there was the first Theron war that there was the Theron war that was a few years ago, but things are kind of stable right now. And then suddenly we get the triumph landing, the King getting assassinated, Carafod being reborn within two or three years of that, in fourth edition timeline, the Harwood incident and the second Theron war and yeah. like Ned and dying and like a whole bunch of stuff happens in a relatively short period of time. Mm-hmm. And it can feel like everything happening at once. And then, so, so it's like, let's have a period of a few years where everything is just kind of settling down and maybe not getting back to normal, but settling into a new status quo. Yeah that then kind of gives things a chance to breathe, gives time for like people's in their own games to maybe have had some other stuff happen or, or whatever. No, it, it mimics uh, the lifespan of a human, of a people on earth right now, which is your, most of your life is just kind of routine and things don't really happen a lot. And then all of a sudden major catastrophes happen and then those are gone again. Those are resolved and you move on with your life and you have two or three years where not a lot happens again. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, I mean, that, that was, you know, Thrall is still there. There are still individuals in Thrall that 
will want to be involved and have influence on what's going on, mm -hmm. but the broader political will within the kingdom to get involved in things might not be there so much anymore because of the, the heavy cost of, of the war and driving the Therans out. Yeah, it was successful, but it came about because Varalis and his son like yeah. pushed us to be more involved in things and well, my boy didn't come back from the war. Maybe that's not such a great thing. Yes, that's not a great thing. So that pretty much gets us, gets us caught up to current day in Thrall. Current year, I believe, is 1517. Yep. So we advanced the timeline. About five, about five years. Yeah. Well, 1507 is where things, yeah. I was going to say eight years from, or nine years roughly from the end of the first edition, where things mm -hmm. kind of stalled out in terms of... Yeah. of plot advancement um, yes. but basically like five years from five years from this from the harwood incident to the president day because it was you know even with the it's not like it suddenly went from the harwood incident to to war there was still time for stuff to build and whatnot and transpire yeah you know it was uh, it was like you know the succession was debated in 1514 which is a couple of years after the harwood incident so there was still time it was happening but basically it allowed a little bit of a, of a skip ahead and we've got a, a new status quo that has things that are familiar but also new and you know just kind of trying to set an area that allows for adventure and allows us as we continue to work on things to you know start telling some new stories Give us room to play. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if no, I was going to say, to, to wrap up, if anybody has any more specific questions about some of the stuff here in this, in this latter part, feel free to write uh, an email, <laughs> edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. As always, we appreciate your listening. Spread the word. And I like, I like seeing, actually, in the emails that we do get, like how multiple ones have said, hey, I'm getting back into gaming or, uh, you know, oh. Earth Dawn, or I'm introducing new people. That's really cool to see. I, I, I love that. I, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. And the, the goal ultimately with the update of the timeline for fourth edition and setting things the way that they are was giving people a place to set their own stories and to, to make their own bar safe um, out of that. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, as, as, as we develop, we may have some things that change, you know, that, that, that change the face of, of things a little bit or whatnot. I mean, we're, we've got like the, um, the Legends of, of Bar Save living campaign stuff that's got all of those, those adventures that are set in Haven. Like yeah. those are telling a story that is ultimately, when it's done, going to have shaped the present day situation of Haven and to kind of steer its future in a sense because the choices of the people that play in those games at conventions or report to us from their home games or whatever, um, they actually do inform some of what is being developed for the later adventures in that series. So there is some of that that is, that is going on, just nothing on the prelude to war scale. It nah, doesn't have to be anymore. No. But that's why I close every episode of this by saying uh, thank you to Josh for keeping the light burning for all of us, because that spark from his fire, keeping the torch lit, uh, has now, for at least the last few emails we've gotten over the last few episodes, created a spark in everybody else. And we all know fire burns and burns like, burns crazy sometimes. So burns like wildfire is a th is a phrase, and I'm going to go with that. So by sometimes all means, it, everybody... Sometimes it destroys 25% of our account. <laughs> sometimes it does. But by all means, thank you, Josh, for keeping the light burning. And for everybody else who's getting that spark to play this game again, reinvigorate yourselves and, and introduce it to other people and get their fire burning as well. Either tabletop game, be more social, take your pick, and by all means, indulge in fourth edition. I don't care if you're playing first, second, third, or fourth. We prefer fourth right now because we're <laughs> plugging that hard, but the work has been put in and we, Josh and his group are expanding the line as much as they possibly can, as fast as they can, and as adeptly as they can to get the feel right from here on out so thank you again josh for allowing me to be your co-host on this uh we have many for, for coming along for the ride oh total we have many many episodes planned so we're not going anywhere anytime soon so for now folks we thank you for listening and it is time for you to go make your own legend be good to each other